This is CBC Here and Now. This beautiful girl touched my heart. She honestly gave me hope. It's hard to believe that such a little girl, such a beautiful little soul, had to go through so much. The veil is one of my best friends. At least she's not suffering no more. Remembering Nevea. A community comes together for a child gone too soon. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. A community said goodbye today to Nevea Denine at a funeral in the Ghouls. The nine-year-old spent years raising money for other kids with cancer. She lost her own battle with the disease on Monday evening. Here and now's Kate McGilvery is in the Ghouls tonight. Kate, what can you tell us about today? Well, first of all, I can tell you that this was not like other funerals. As you can see behind me, there are decorations and streamers and balloons. What Nevea's family wanted was for this to be a celebration of her nine years of life, and the community here in the Goulds rose to that occasion. I'm very emotional because it's, it's hard to believe that such a little girl, such a beautiful little soul had to go through so much. I mean, she was sick most of her life since she was probably two years old. The day began with a procession of vintage cars done up in Nevea's favorite colors. Along the route, people out in droves to pay their respects. Dorothy Pike is a friend of the Denine family. Just wanted to give our love and support, and let them know just that we do care, everybody cares. A little down the way, a lemonade stand to honor Nevea's tireless fundraising for other pediatric patients. She taught us all a lot, and just as support, we're out here today to, um, Obviously something here, the lemonade stand, that was, is going to be always her legacy. Uh, it's just our way of paying tribute. The procession ended up at St. Kevin's Church in the Goulds, the town where Nevea grew up and went to school. Mourners wore light-colored clothing in celebration of her life, and friends and family filled the church. I am here because Nevea was one of my best friends. She always went camping with us. It was sad, but... You know, she's in a better place now. At least she's not suffering no more. Everyone had something to say about the way Nevea had impacted their lives. This beautiful girl touched my heart. She honestly gave me hope in a very hard time when I had lost somebody to cancer. And I actually had the privilege to meet her in March um, after holding a party for my mother who had passed away. We raised money and I was unbelievably grateful to get to donate it to her lemonade stand and to get to meet her. I've been hearing that a lot over the last few days, people telling me that Nevea inspired them to dig deeper and give more. The Confederation Building in St. John's will be lit in yellow tonight in her honor, giving everyone who drives by a chance to reflect on what her life meant. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Kate McGilvery in the Goulds. Another suspected arson in Grand Falls, Windsor. It's the fourth this summer, and the town's Chamber of Commerce says businesses should take precaution. I'll bring you those details coming up on Here and Now. Well, the province is looking at replacing Her Majesty's Penitentiary. The Department of Justice has hired a consultant to look at how the province can get the most out of its money. A new prison moved up the priority list after CBC published letters from inmates complaining about conditions on the inside. Here and now's Malone Mullen is live with more tonight. Malone? Well, there's been a lot of criticism here over the last few months. Uh, most of it focused on the prison building itself. People on the inside and the outside all seem to agree a replacement is needed and the province is looking into it. Prisoners here have slammed the conditions of this antique prison. The pen has long been criticized by lawyers, the Human Rights Commission and recently the families of inmates, two of whom died by suicide behind these bars in the last year. The glaring problem, according to all these critics, is the facility itself, something the Justice Department agrees with and says it's taking steps to change. We're bringing in policy that I think is going to be some of the best in Canada, but, you know, when we still have these buildings that are outdated, it, it hinders our ability to do as much as we want to do. In a change of tune today, Parsons said the province is now making a new pen a priority, hiring a consulting company to figure out how to afford the project on a tight budget. Parsons also said he asked the feds once again for help, but exactly who's footing the bill is still up in the air. 
we'll continue to work with the feds, but this is not something we can wait on. This is something that I think is a, a need and is a need now. Among the short-term changes done or in the works, a new addictions counselor, more checks on inmates, better access to health care. But of all the issues at HMP, one complaint stands out. Inmates on suicide watch are still kept in solitary confinement. Small, isolating cells condemned by critics and blamed by inmates for making their mental states even worse. Parsons says it's because of the prison's layout. They simply have nowhere else to put inmates threatening to harm themselves. He once told the Human Rights Commission sick inmates weren't being put in solitary, but he reversed that statement today. It's happening, and it likely won't change until a new pen is built. Plans for a new jail drawn up in 2014 included a mental health unit to avoid keeping sick inmates in segregation. Parsons said today those plans are still under consideration. We have a, a bricks and mortar issue down there when it comes to space built to handle individuals facing these challenges. So no promises have been made, there's no timeline yet, but Parsons said earlier today that getting something built is a priority. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Malone Mullen in St. John's. It's been a secret for four years, but today the people who provided the funding to help cleanse the Rocky Harbor Blue Whale to be put on display here at Memorial University reveal themselves. I'll have that story coming up. Searchers are looking for a berry picker who has been missing since last night. Members of a ground search and rescue team are looking for 67-year-old Harvey Rowe. He was picking berries along a dirt road between Markland and Colinet. Rowe was reported missing around 11 o'clock last night. Helicopters and a police dog are also involved in the search, as well as police officers from the Placentia and Whitburn detachments of the RCMP. Rowe is from Broadcove. Sorry. There's a reason to hope for skilled workers in this province. Politicians say the town of Marystown is offering to buy the idled Marystown shipyard from Kiwit Offshore Services. Local MHA Mark Brown says the plan is for the town to buy it, then lease it to businessman Paul Antle and a Norwegian group who would operate it. Brown says they plan to develop an aquaculture supply service base at the shipyard. It's not a done deal yet, though. I always say nothing's done until it's done, uh, but this is uh, this was made public today by the town and 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 by the group uh, that this purchase is in the works, and this is very positive because for so long this uh, facility, which was built with taxpayers' dollars, has been laying idle in the center of Marystown. So the prospect of hundreds of jobs back in Marystown, which are stable, continuous for our very skilled workforce. Well, if you bought Dole brand baby spinach recently, you might want to take a second look. Dole is recalling some of its spinach over concerns about listeria contamination. It's recalling baby spinach with tender reds after tests by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency found possible listeria contamination. The spinach was sold throughout Atlantic Canada, including here in a package of 142 grams and has an expiry date of August 4th. For more details on the UPC code, head to our website cbc.ca slash nl. Businesses in Grand Falls, Grand Falls, Windsor are being warned after several suspicious fires over the past few weeks. The RCMP have been called to seven fires and believe arson is involved in four of them. As Here and Now's Garrett Berry tells us, the Grand Falls, Windsor Chamber of Commerce is warning business owners to take precautions. What we're seeing here is the aftermath of another suspicious fire in this town. It's the fourth that police in Grand Falls, Windsor suspect was arson. This time last week, these two wooden structures looked identical, but now one has been burned to bits. That was then, this is now. No one was injured because this warehouse is empty, but another suspected arson? I mean, to say that we're not concerned would be ludicrous. I mean, um, but uh, we have to deal with it. Before this, a siding business was struck, and before that, the town's ski club. It started out uh, with these fires on the outskirts of the community, and now it seems like they have moved into the community itself. Police say there's nothing conclusive to link these fires together, but they have been happening near wooded areas, and there's definitely more than usual. So can you remember anything like this happening in the past? No, no. 
So what can businesses do to protect themselves? It's all common sense, of course. Have good surveillance. Uh, have a good security system. Uh, try and make your business itself as foolproof as you can. But the important part when it comes to the fires part of it is make sure that your the perimeter of your building is free from clutter. The chamber is now asking businesses around here to be a little bit more vigilant, to clear their properties of anything that can be easily burned, and also to check their security cameras to see if they've caught anything that can help police crack the case. Garrett Perry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Teen baseball players from Corner Brook got to experience the famous film A League of Their Own last week. 13-year-old girls took part in the Baseball for All National Tournament in Rockford, Illinois, home of the famous Rockford Peaches. The under-16 competition is designed to empower girls to play and stick with the sport. The team ended up winning nationals and they stopped by Corner Brook's morning show to talk all about it. It was just an awesome experience and to play baseball down there was even better. Why was it so great? Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so many people were like so nice and every all the feeling you get when you walk into an indoor field, an outdoor field just made you like fall in love with baseball all over again. Another gold medal for Katarina Roxon. The Paralympic swimming champion from Kippens, Newfoundland is dominating in Australia. Roxon snagged goal in the women's 100 meter breaststroke earlier today at the Pan Pacific Para Swimming Championships. The 24 year old won her first gold medal at the Paralympics Games in Rio back in 2016. Roxon's back in the pool tomorrow to race the 100 meter freestyle. Congrats, Katarina, and good luck in the pool tomorrow. Colleen Connors in Cornerbrook where they just announced a huge tourism plan to bring more tourists to meet Maggie here at the Newfoundland Emporium. Oh, oh. now big one. Ah. <laughs> well. I'll have that story for you tonight. How many bees do you think are in this hive? I'd say there's... <coughs> I'd say about 40,000. 40,000? 40, yep.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Saudi Arabian born students at MUN are in limbo. The Saudi government has ordered all of its post secondary students out of Canada. Officials made the call after tweets from Canada's foreign affairs minister and the Canadian foreign policy account criticized Saudi Arabia's handling of human rights cases. Memorial University has 23 Saudi students enrolled in the upcoming semester. The school hasn't been contacted about the future of those students yet but it's anticipating a call. Given the uncertainty of the situation and um, the sensitivity of the situation, a lot is up in the air right now. Folks are at the university level and at the students union level are trying to find out um, the impacts of this. Um, so that's all I can really say at the moment. Um, but rest assured that we are looking to support the students throughout this transition. The IOC mine in Labrador City may be up for sale, though the company is staying mum about it. The report comes from Reuters Wire Service, which cited unnamed sources in banking and industry. It suggests Rio Tinto, which owns nearly 60% of IOC shares, is considering listing the company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The story also suggested Rio Tinto was hoping to take advantage of healthy prices in the iron ore market. Now, this isn't the first time the company has tried to sell its share of the mine. It did it back in 2012, but was unable to find a suitable buyer. The MHA for the area says the mine is a valuable asset. There's all kinds of possibilities that people that may be interested in the Labrador Trough. When you look at the region and the Labrador Trough, I mean, we're looking at really one resource that's there. So who operates in that region, I guess, it remains to be seen. But I think there's all kinds of possibilities who any potential bidders may be. A Holocaust survivor who shared his painful memories with thousands of students in this province is being remembered tonight. Philip Reitman died in his sleep at his home in Halifax yesterday morning. He was 96 years old. They open the doors and they give us wheelbarrows and we take the dead bodies on the wheelbarrows and running maybe a couple hundred feet, turn over the wheelbarrow and go take the rest of them living and they're still warm. He emigrated to Newfoundland in 1946 before it was part of Canada. He lived here until 1981 before moving to Nova Scotia. But he came back here to speak to students about the horrors he witnessed in concentration camps. He did it so the victims of the Holocaust would be remembered and to prevent it from ever happening again. The CBC's Amy Smith has this look at his life. They round us up and they divided us. But I, mean, I didn't know. It's a story Philip Reitman didn't speak about for four decades. His experiences in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. But starting in the 1980s, he decided he needed to share his first-hand account of the Holocaust, making sure everyone knew the full horror of what happened. I was the 98,706th person. He spoke to countless students and community groups over the years, reliving painful memories of Hitler's war against the Jews. The Nazis direct their fire across the harbor. I sat down with Reitman for an interview in 2014 to talk about his life. I never forget when the first Germans motorcycle came in to our town. Could you imagine my town the size of Truro? And could imagine one million men going through our town with tanks and trucks and everything. Reitman was around 14 when the Germans came into Poland and rounded up his entire family. They were shipped to the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz, where his parents and his seven brothers and sisters were killed. I wish I wouldn't survive. I live for this. You cannot have the feeling what I have. I have to come and kill all your father and everything, destroy your life. That's the reason I didn't speak for 40 years. After the war, Reitman moved to Newfoundland to live with an aunt. And it was in his adopted country he said he once again discovered humanity. Most Canadians are nice, generous. They're good people. I don't want to them to them or to their children. That's maybe I survived to tell. Reitman's son Larry says his father had a special connection with the young people he shared his story with. He could do what so many others couldn't. That was, it, it was absolutely, he could put it in, he could put it on their scale so that they could grasp it. And a lot of survivors can't do that. 
At one point, Philip Reitman was speaking to as many as 80 schools a year, and the impact was powerful. Philip Reitman was 96 years old. Amy Smith, CBC News, Halifax. This is all of the edible honey that we just pulled from the hive. So how, how much is this worth, you guys? What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. There's so much buzz about Carolyn's bees. And after her forecast, Carolyn shows us how bee experts are dealing with the hive that she found inside of her home. Update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, welcome back to Here and Now. Big change yesterday and today, Carolyn, yeah. in terms of the weather. Yeah, I was I... a lot sweatier yesterday <laughs> than I was today. I'll tell it you was that. much cooler. It was almost shockingly cool when I walked out this morning. Well, it's spoiled, spoiled here. We get a yeah. little bit of nice weather and we get spoiled. Yeah, and you know, we just have a little bit of rain to get through and then we're back to some really nice temperatures for a good stretch of time. Let's uh, start with a look at the highs today. It got up to 19 degrees in St. John's today. We didn't even crack the 20 degree mark in 
in St. John. So yes, it was much, much cooler uh, than we've been used to in Central, though. 25 degrees in Badger. Corner Brook was lovely. 25 degrees. Lots of rain heading their way tonight. You can see it right here on the satellite and radar coming up through. It's going to start in the west and persist to the east overnight tonight, as well as in a Labrador. You can see much of the heavier showers heading towards the straits and to the west coast overnight tonight. And uh, yeah, throughout tomorrow, pretty much everyone is going to get a taste of this. But overnight tonight, we're looking at a chance of some thunder showers in the Corner Brook area, about 15 to 25 millimeters of rain. And the winds are a bit gusty there, too. We're looking at uh, gusts to 60 along the coast. Uh, for St. John's, overnight low of 13 degrees, 15 in Gander with a chance of showers there in Labrador in the Straits area, looking at about 10 millimeters of rain overnight tonight that will continue tomorrow and about five millimeters tonight in Lab City with also a chance of some thunder showers there. So tomorrow morning when you get up, St. John's metro area is going to be pretty cloudy, similar to what it was this morning. 16 degrees to start the day. Those temperatures are really going to bump up throughout the day. Pretty warm to start in uh, the Buren Peninsula area, 18 degrees. Western Newfoundland looking good, but it's going to be a wet start to the day uh, for the Corner Brook area and some cooler temperatures there in the north and in Labrador. So yes, this is uh, Friday at 6 a.m. So tomorrow morning, you can see all of the showers right across the province. Uh, in the east, mostly we're looking at overcast skies. It won't be until later in the day that we'll start to see some of those showers. So for most of the day, we're looking at about 26 degrees and a chance of showers in the east, 19 degrees along the, the south coast there with a chance of showers throughout the day. Now for the Marystown area, 10 to 20 millimeters of rain expected there tomorrow and 21 degrees as the high, but 5 to 10 millimeters of rain for central areas tomorrow and uh, temperatures in the mid 20s there. Another 5 to 10 millimeters of rain for the west coast, the Cornerbrook area. So it's going to continue to be pretty wet for the morning. It should clear off throughout the day. For the Straits, uh, for St. Anthony area, looking at about 15 millimeters of rain tomorrow. So yeah, it's going to stay pretty wet, but it will clear off uh, throughout the day, as well as in Labrador, 5 to 10 millimeters of rain. And look at these temperatures, much cooler there tomorrow. So it is going to be a pretty chilly day. Lab City, 12 degrees as the high. A little bit better there in Happy Valley Goose Bay. But, you know, things are going to look really good as we head into uh, the weekend. Some really good temperatures. The island is going to be seeing a mix of sun and cloud and temperatures in the mid-20s. I'll have uh, all of those details. Coming up a bit later, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Ms. Stokes. Sounds like some pretty sweet weather, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of sweet, there has been a lot of buzz online about your honeybee story. I'm yeah. sure you've seen it. Yeah. It's been blowing up on Twitter, as the kids say. It's been all bees all the time. And, uh, you know, it's a question I never thought I'd ask. You know, what do you do when you get a hive of honeybees living in your home? It was just, it was such a shock. And I found out firsthand this week when I learned that thousands 40,000 actually of honeybees had set up shop inside the walls 40, of my house. 40,000 uninvited guests. Uninvited guests. <laughs> but uh, luckily the folks at Adelaide's, Adelaide's Bee Reserve, Paul and Brenda Din, they swooped in to help. And of course, uh, we filmed the whole thing. So have a look. So it's just right okay, yeah. there. Yeah. Do you think there yeah. are very many in there? I would say there's a good, uh, you could be looking at a colony of, of anywhere from 30 to 50,000 honeybees. 30 to 50,000? In there, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> we really need our honeybees. We really need them. Why do we need them? We have literally, we're one of the few places in the world that have the healthiest honeybees and we've got to really protect and cherish them. Honeybees will give us one third of the world's food supply. So any fruits, anything that flowers is pollinated by a, a type of bee or a pollinator. And we really, really desperately need them. The bees are up in a, in a, I guess, a dormer window, and uh, they're just uh, foraging, collecting pollen and nectar, and you can see them coming and going, very calm, relaxed. But they're, they're, they're in the third floor of a home. We'll just gradually remove part of the wall, and then we're gonna add a little smoke to the bees, calm them down, and we're gonna slowly start taking comb, honeycomb, and putting it into actual honeybee frames, and then in installing them into beehives. Oh my god. 
god. Oh my god. How many bees do you think are in this hive? I'd say there's, I'm guessing now, I would say, I'd say about 40,000. 40,000? 40, yep. They're actually just a nice sized colony. They're looking really good though, guys. There's gonna be a lot of bees in here in a moment. So that's lots of bees, lots of comb. And we're gonna put this one into the hive. So that's your first frame. You try to keep it as in form as possible. There's actual honey dripping down on my head. Usually we capture them in, in a swarm where they're just looking for a new home and they're hanging in a tree or on the side of a building, what have you. But this is the first one, to my knowledge, of one actually being taken out of a home that's already established. So this is all of the edible honey that we just pulled from the hive. So how, how much is this worth, you guys? weigh it, uh, I'd say that's worth a small piece like this. We sell for about $40. Wow. Uh, so you, you've got a good 10 pounds or more there of comb honey. We have 400 And it's as organic as it gets. As organic <laughs> as it gets. We've put all the honeycomb and the bees, as many bees as possible, into the hive. Hopefully the queen is in there as well. And what, what's going to happen now is, over the next few hours, as it gets darker, the bees are going to signal to the others that this is the way home. And by the time we come back tonight, the majority of the bees should be in the beehive. All right, so they're all in here. Yeah. And what happens now? We'll go home and we'll, uh, we'll lay them on. We have a hive, st a hive stand ready for them. We'll place them on the hive stand and then tomorrow morning we'll release them and let them out and they'll, they'll become orientated. Good morning, I am out to Adelaide's Bee Reserve out in the Ghouls with a Paul Din and we are just about to release the bees into their uh, new temporary home so I thought you might like to see it. How are they doing? They're doing good. They're just, they're just like Full. That is just chock full of bees. There's tons, so they're going to take a little while to kind of say, oh, where are we, and we're home, and everything else, and then they'll be fine. Success! Yay! <laughs> and I, oof. <laughs> so I got to ask, so what happens, so your bees are gone, never coming back? No, no, Whoa. they're, they're going to stay at Adelaide's for about two weeks. Uh, while I repair my house <laughs> uh, because oh, they can't man. stay on the property because then they'll just go right back in. Uh, so in two weeks, I'm going to adopt the hive or the hive has adopted me. <laughs> so uh, Paul and, and Brenda at Adelaide, they have this program, Adopt a Hive. So they're gonna help me out and set me up and uh, the bees are gonna come home. And I you. actually brought in a little bit of comb just to show everyone. And uh, I wanted you to have a little well, sample. I never say no to food. Tastes like <laughs> organic honey. With some delicious bagel. Yeah. From Mana Bakery, I got this. It is very good. <laughs> it's not as sweet as no. store-bought honey. Man, is it ever awfully good. Yeah. They say that every um, every honey from a, from a hive like that has its own unique flavor. So you can don't take too much of a bite because we still have to speak. You can invite me over anytime <laughs> for honey and bagels. Cheers. <laughs> Nickname is Penny. They're already saying that the whale will probably be known as Penny. I think that's just fantastic. I think we'll think about it. What have you done for your mom lately? Well, the Dobbins are naming a blue whale after their mom. Oh, no, big one. <laughs> Maggie from the Newfoundland Emporium is the center of attention today in Cornerbrook as the region unveils money for a new tourism plan.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Bay of Islands got a tourism boost today. Nearly $100,000 will go to a new tourism plan to put Corner Brook and surrounding areas on the global map. The big announcement took place at one of the most touristy places in town, the Newfoundland Emporium. Here and Now's Colleen Connors was there. Here's your water. Oh, there you this is Maggie. She's the mascot for this kitschy place. Three store floors of Newfoundland history and memorabilia. But I love the Newfoundland Emporium. We could not get a better location, Dave, to talk a little bit about the benefits, the full stream of benefits that occur from growing our tourism industry. The announcement? Well, the city, province, and the federal government contributed $90,000 to a new tourism plan. But what is it exactly? This is, I guess, funding for a tourism strategy development for the Bay of Islands region and the lower Humber Valley. Consultants will come in, ask people in the tourist industry, like Emporium owner Dave LeDrew, how to make Cornerbrook a prime tourism destination. I think it's about time. I mean, for years, I mean, they, they built a highway around Cornerbrook, and as a consequence, the, the year after they built the new trans Highway, business absolutely took a dive in Cornerbrook from tourism because the government is spending all kinds of money promoting gross morn. And it's great, and, I, and but the benefit um, goes mostly to, to Deer Lake because that, that's a natural staging area, Deer Lake. Deer Lake has a tremendous advantage over us, but we've got to work at it to make sure we get our share, and all we want is our share. The plan is to get people to stop in on their way from St. John's or Gross Morn and spend more dollars at hotels, restaurants and shops. We believe that we have a great asset here in the Bay of Islands and uh, we just need a little help and I think uh, a little more cooperation between the governments and the private sector and the public sector to really make the Bay of Islands a, a, a top destination in Newfoundland. And it starts with places like this and a good plan. It's going to take 12 to even 18 months to come up with this tourism plan and a goal to target Cornerbrook and the Bay of Islands to tourists so they come to stores like this and buy more stuff like this. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Sorry. It's been a long road for a blue whale carcass that washed ashore in Rocky Harbor four years ago. Today, Memorial University made public that the Dobbin family fronted the funding to give the massive mammal a permanent home in Munn's new core science building. Before we get to that announcement, here's a look back on the journey of the world's biggest animal. In the winter of 2014, this footage was captured by DFO, the lifeless bodies of two of the biggest creatures on the planet. These were just two of nine who died when crushed by heavy sea ice. As the ice melted, the bloated carcass of one whale rolled around on the beach in Trout River, arguably the world's most famous dead whale, while the second washed ashore in nearby Rocky Harbor. The Royal Ontario Museum took ownership of the whales, but couldn't afford to flense both sea beasts. In May of 2014, Memorial University stepped forward to finance the deboning and cleaning process. But it wasn't the university who paid the tab. Quietly, Mark, Sandra, Craig and Lisa Dobbin funded the expensive process, something kept secret until today. Surrounded by family and university brass, the Dobbins made their role in the Blue Whale story public. Well, like a lot of Newfoundlanders, we were following the press carefully when uh, that tragedy happened and so many blue whales perished. We were very struck with the fact that uh, Ontario, Royal Ontario Museum, showing great leadership, obtained uh, a carcass so that they could extract the skeleton, preserve it, and uh, then display it, and also conduct research on it. And we felt left out as a province, uh, that we didn't have the same opportunity. My wife Sandra was at a uh, function uh, with Gary Kachanowski, president of the Memorial University of Newfoundland, was there and challenged him to, uh, so why don't we have a whale? And he indicated that they didn't have a budget and they needed some financial support. So we agreed to uh, financially support the university in this noble endeavor. My brother Craig and his wife Lisa also uh, volunteered and jumped at the opportunity to help and that's how we got here. First of all, we're big supporters of Memorial University and having 
such a dramatic display in what's going to be a state-of-the-art, world-class research facility here on campus, in and of itself is of benefit. My mother, who we are doing this uh, gift in honor of, is originally from Bjorn, and off uh, Bjorn is Bjorn Island, and when I was young, I toured it in my uncle's boat and saw the uh, old remains of abandoned uh, whaling station there and was very struck uh, as a young man on uh, tragedy of hunting animals as, as magnificent as whales. So that always stayed with me and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we undertook the, uh, the gift. What was your mom's reaction when you told her that uh, you know the Dobbin boys were going to team up and uh, help finance this massive whale project? We only actually told her a couple of weeks ago. So uh, it's been a secret since 2014, and uh, she was uh, a little taken aback and uh, overwhelmed, but uh, I think she's risen to the challenge of accepting it uh, quite well, like she does with everything in life. Now, people may be wondering, but how much money goes into putting uh, this project together, Mr. Dobbin? Well, uh, we haven't really disclosed the, uh, the amount of the gift. It was a substantial amount of money, as you can imagine. Um, uh, we partnered with the university on this, and uh, we're, we're just happy to be able to be contributors at this stage. Well, I think it's the university's whale now and the people of the province. Uh, what feels really cool for me is, I think, and my mom's nickname is Penny, and uh, the people at the memorial uh, here are already saying that the whale will probably be known as Penny. And uh, I think that's just fantastic. I'm tickled pink about it. Oh, it's so nice. It is very nice. Where's day. the whale now? So, the first one was a Trout River whale, and that was the one that was on display in the ROM. So mm -hmm. that's still in Toronto. But I did made, made a few phone calls today, and I tracked down the Rocky Harbor, Rocky Harbor whale, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. Penny. And that's, uh, it's been deboned, been degreased, it's ready to be mounted whenever the building is ready, and it's currently sitting in a sort of warehouse in Trenton, Ontario. But uh, I spoke to the company who puts it together, and they said they're ready to go whenever the building's ready. So, hopefully 2020, we'll be talking about the blue whale again. <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> if I was a weather geek, I'd probably have that as my ringtone. Oh my goodness. Anyways, what a, whew, never getting invited back. Um, <laughs> jokes. So uh, we were talking earlier, um, when you were outside, we were talking about 
backstage, uh, Julie Skinner, one of the producers of the show, was talking about how beautiful your garden was. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, I, I'm I'm an avid gardener, so and, which is one of the reasons I'm excited about the bees. And what does a garden need? The garden needs lots of sunshine, and, and it also needs a bit, a bit of rain. And what's in the forecast coming up? <laughs> this is a good setup. There's a bit of rain. I'm and actually there's pretty a bit good of at this. <laughs> good segue, Jeremy. Good thing. Well, I'm have a look at the long-range forecast, starting with uh, some current temperatures, 15 degrees in St. John's right now. So it is definitely a cool evening out there. Still pretty. Hot there in Badger, 23 degrees at the moment. For Labrador, Happy Valley Goose Bay, look at that, uh, 19 degrees right now, so not half bad. So yes, the showers that Jeremy mentioned overnight tonight, pretty much everyone is gonna get a taste of this system at some point. The showers beginning tonight, mostly on the West Coast and for the Straits and for Western Labrador. So throughout tomorrow, uh, you can see lots of scattered showers. The East won't see this until later in the day into Friday afternoon, Friday evening. And uh, yeah, the showers kind of persist throughout the day for Labrador. So tomorrow we're going to return to those warm temperatures, 26 degrees in St. John's. And with that humid X, it's going to feel more like 33. So yeah, it's going to be pretty humid again tomorrow. Uh, so with some of those late day showers for the central area, could see some showers around noontime, early afternoon uh, for the south coast, 10 to 20 millimeters of rain. So that's where the heaviest rain is going to fall uh, tomorrow on the island. Five to 10 millimeters of rain for the Cornerbrook area on top of what falls tonight for Labrador. Some cooler temperatures than the island, particularly for Lab City, 12 degrees there with uh, some showers that uh, should be clearing off throughout the day, looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain tomorrow. So unfortunately for Labrador, those showers are going to stick around into the weekend. But for the island, Friday evening, the showers will start to uh, move away. And as we get into Saturday, 6 a.m., things clear off quite nicely. You can see the odd shower there on the northern peninsula, but then things are looking great for the island. So for Labrador, some chances of showers in the early parts of the day and cooler temperatures for the west, 16 degrees, 20 degrees for the east. And just look at the island looking fantastic for the weekend so far. 25 degrees in the east, pretty much mid 20s all across the island. Mix of sun and cloud, just dandy. And uh, Saturday evening into Sunday, it's a similar story. We have some showers going through for the southeastern portion of Labrador and the northern peninsula there uh, and some more showers uh, into the evening for the west. But on the island, another great day. So it's times two for beautiful weather on the weekend for the island. Mix of sun and cloud and temperatures continue in the mid 20s. Not half bad in temperature wise, at least in the southeast, 23 degrees with those showers and as well for Labrador. So those showers will persist. But look at this nice stretch of weather we're getting into for the east. Mix of sun and clouds, sunshine, lovely temperatures right on through to Tuesday so far. Similar story for central areas and as well for the west. So we're going into a really nice stretch of weather on the island. Not so much for Labrador. The weekend is looking pretty wet, starting to clear off as you begin the work week though. And uh, for western Labrador, clearing off on Monday in a bit of overcast skies and some cooler temperatures on Tuesday. That's your forecast. Jeremy, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. A cat in Nova Scotia is making an amazing recovery this week. It was shot. And now the SPCA is asking for help to find out who is responsible. The CBC's Shana Luck has the story. If the bullet had been a couple of millimeters in either direction, Vox would never have lived to come home. But the nearly two-year-old cat survived the attack that happened sometime between Sunday morning and Monday night. They say cats have nine lives, so I, I, my husband and I said he's probably down to maybe six because that was a, a big one, but <laughs> he's, uh, he's coming around slowly but surely. Vox showed up on the back step clearly injured, but it wasn't apparent right away how bad his injuries were until they arrived at the vets. She said, I think you're going to want to come and see this x-ray. Beverly Greenlaw says her heart sank when she saw it. She couldn't believe someone would do this. All of these dark pieces that you see here are bullet fragments. The bullet passed through Vox's head, exiting near his left eye. He may lose sight in that eye and will be permanently deaf in one ear. Part of his jaw and some teeth are gone. At the vet clinic, they're spreading the word. The SPCA is investigating. Greenlaw believes this was not a BB pellet, but a bullet used to hunt coyotes. 
this kind of action is purely malicious and it's not something that you could say was in any way an accident. Somebody actually had to go get a gun, load a gun, aim the gun, pull the trigger. Angela Dauphiny is thankful Vox's injuries were not worse, but it's been a terrible episode for her family. Their loving cat is now afraid to be alone and startles at sudden noises. I am really hoping that if, you know, it just doesn't happen to anyone ever again, you know? I mean, it's, it's our pet. He's, he's part of the family, just like anyone else who has pets. And just maybe people will think twice. Shana Luck, CBC News, New Cornwall. Well, now a message for dog owners living in condos or apartments. Don't use retractable leashes. A Toronto woman's puppy was nearly strangled in an elevator. And as Nick Vaver reports, she wants to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Yeah. A good boy? Of course. And after what happened a few weeks ago, a very lucky boy, too. Luckily, he's okay. So it's a miracle dog. Aren't you, buddy? Hmm. Last month, Emily Pinkard and Oscar stepped off the elevator on their way home. The four month old Aussie Doodle had other ideas. I reached into my purse to grab my keys, and while I did that, he bolted back into the elevator just as the doors were closing. She frantically unlocked her retractable leash and listened to the elevator descend two agonizing floors. So that's like it was literally pulled, I guess, as far as it would go. I wish that it had, you know, broken. Then I started to hear the elevator come back up, and um, the door opened, and he actually, he fell, like, in front of me. The dog was borderline unconscious, but within seconds, Oscar popped back up. I have heard this happening before. I've had two other cases, and unfortunately, the, they were adult dogs, and they didn't survive it. So. Oscar's vet says elevator stranglings like Oscar's or this one are more likely to happen with a retractable leash. I find that they, they, they can fail on people. Those locks don't always work. Dogs can get away from people. To prevent them happening, he's advising people to ditch their retractable leashes, but they are popular around Toronto. Why do you opt for this kind of leash? Well, when we're walking and it's safe, you know, we're not even on the street, I let her go right to the end. She likes to run around a little bit, right? And if it's just a, a, you know, a stagnant leash, she can't do that. So what the vet recommends is having your dog on a leash like this one that's under two meters, making sure that you're both together when you go in the elevator. Anyway, leashes longer than two meters are technically banned under city bylaws. Pinkard says, She's done with hers. Now I'm warning everybody, <laughs> like in my building, whenever I see somebody who's using a retractable leash, I tell them, be careful near the elevator. Nick Boisvert, CBC News, Toronto. From Animal Hour to outer space, the U.S. Armed Forces is eyeing space to become the next military frontier. The Trump administration says threats from China and Russia are the impetus behind the creation of what it's calling the U.S. Space Force. The space environment has fundamentally changed in the last generation. What was once peaceful and uncontested is now crowded and adversarial. Today, other nations are seeking to disrupt our space-based systems and challenge American supremacy in space as never before. Our adversaries have transformed space into a warfighting domain already. The plan is to have a U.S. Department of the Space Force in place by 2020. Congress would have to approve the startup budget of $8 billion over five years. Now, Pence told an audience at the Pent Pentagon the aim is to defend U.S. military and intelligence satellites from hypersonic missiles and laser attacks. Critics call the creation redundant and wasteful. Here's a look at today's viewer photo of the day. What a pretty scene this is. Kind of hard to guess where the uh, shot Which part of the island? Which part of the island? Uh, it's in the coastal area of the north. It, this place has one of the prettiest names of a community in the province, I think. Eddie's Cove? No. <laughs> Eddie's Cove South. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll let you know where this was taken after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We just have enough time to have a look at our viewer photo of the day. Let's have a look at this. So, yes, this is not Eddie's Cove, uh, Jeremy. This was taken uh, in Fleur de Lis. Yeah, that is a beautiful part yeah. of the palace. It is that is a beautiful gorgeous. photo, too. It is lovely. Great colors. The boat's all lined up there. Dana Osmond, thank you so much for sending this in. If anyone else has a, a shot to send in, we get some gorgeous photos. We really always appreciate do. A lot that. of good photographers out there. Yeah. Keep, keep them coming because we like, and it gets us to keep guessing where it is. Mm -hmm. So it's and fun someday game. we'll actually get close. Not like, <laughs> not like me tonight. Anyways. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.